I always wanted to join the Special Forces, ever since I was in school. It was my dream to be an elite SAS soldier. I had this indescribable desire deep inside of me to test myself against others. I joined the army in 1996 at the age of 16. I'd heard all of these stories about the SAS, this British Special Forces elite unit who carried out top secret missions. They only took the best of the best, and to get in you had to pass one of, if not the hardest, physical human tests ever created. Only 7% of people who would even try would get through. But I could not get rid of this desire to go for selection. And so in 2005, I started the process. First, I had to pass a 12 month long reserve selection. I did that. I then served a further year until I was allowed to go for regular SAS selection. I got all the way through the worst bits, miles upon miles up and down the Welsh mountains in the most extreme of weather conditions, followed by horrendous physical tests in the arduous terrain of the Brunei jungle, only to get back and to go in front of the train officer and be told that I had failed. It's one of those moments I will never forget. I was speechless, I felt sick. I'd pushed myself to the absolute limits and at the end, it still wasn't enough. I felt so embarrassed to tell anyone I had failed. I was given the opportunity to come back and try again. But before that, I went out on an operational tour to Afghanistan. The tour was hard. I lost three friends and I was almost killed myself in an explosion. All after failing to reach my goal, my dream. I went for it again. And on my second attempt, I'd managed to get through to the jungle phase. And in the fourth week, on a particular day's training, I collapsed and nearly died with heat exhaustion. I was evacuated by helicopter to an A&E hospital. That was the second attempt over for me. It took me a year to recover and pass the test required to get signed off by the medical board to be approved to reattempt selection for the third time. Immediately, I started to train harder than ever before. I'd spend three days a week running over the mountains, enhancing my navigation and fitness. Every night, I'd spend hours studying tactics. It was 2011, and there I was on my third attempt. The hills, the jungle, interrogation. I passed and achieved my dream. It was like being a king. Nothing could stop me. I controlled my life and determined the outcome and often determine the outcome of the lives of others. I was living the dream. As an SES soldier, I always held this very unique posture, a mix of extreme confidence, yet narcissism, with a lot of arrogance. Even with all that I've achieved, I was completely lost and broken. I was empty inside, incomplete, despite achieving one of the greatest human feats anyone can do. I could keep shoving it down and deny it, or open up to a new future. The typical image of an elitist creates an ego, and it's not long before you think you're invincible, untouchable, that you hold life and death in your own hand. During the last years in the SES, I met this girl called Naomi. She was going to church one Sunday, and I thought, I'll go with her. It's only church, it's only an hour. For me, coming to Freedom Church for the first time was a very strange experience. It was like going to a nightclub during the daytime, yet, I wasn't drunk. I remember keep being hugged time and time again and thinking, this is weird. We ended up going back three or four more times before I went away on an operational deployment to Iraq. My time in Iraq was very different from the times before. I had questions and I was looking for something, but I didn't know what it looked like. All this death, this indulgence, the life I had known, yet I kept asking the same question, is this it? I came back to Hereford and Lee for two weeks. Me and Naomi came to church, and during a message we were incredibly challenged by Pastor G, which started something deep with insiders. During this time, Naomi really had to put up with a lot of issues that I had going on. I had this very deep rage within me. My heart at the time had hardened after so many years of learning to shut down my emotions as I viewed them as weakness. I was an atheist most of my career. And I boldly said that the Bible was written by man to control man, and that God didn't exist. On an operational tour in the deserts of Iraq, I came face to face with its author. In that moment, I had an indescribable emotional encounter with God, and everything changed. He showed me my present and my past 
with new revelation. He showed me the world as he saw it and told me what my future could look like as I knelt before him in tears. I had suffered with PTSD for many years and had never slept a night without waking up, shouting or kicking. The day I met Jesus, it went away without me even asking. The moment of humility broke through like no moment of my own personal success. Nothing I could craft with all the strength I could muster, all the determination I could choose or even come closer to what God could do in a moment of humility. My life changed. He asked me to follow him and called me to plant church in Cape Town, South Africa, expanding and building his kingdom. I followed Jesus for three years and he's redesigned me, completely renewed my mind, set me free of rage and obsessive control, showed me how to trust him as my provider and my protector, trained me in using his spiritual gifts and accepted me as his son. But this year, he gave me a new heart and given me a daughter. And for the first time, I felt the unconditional love of my father in heaven. You have a choice, your strength or his, your ability or his, your pride or his humility, life or death, physical life and death versus spiritual life or death. Choosing to follow Jesus is above everything else, the best thing I've ever done.